Howdy. Howdy. Yesterday, nearly 100 people in the United States suffered a violent death from a single cause. That's the population of this room. And it happened the day before and the day before that. And we'll lose another room full tomorrow, most likely. And they were doing something that all of us did just to get here, travel from one place to another. In fact, over 37,000 people lost their lives in traffic crashes last year. Pretty soon you'd think somebody would notice and we'd do something about it. And most disturbingly, after a period from about 2006 to 2011, where fatalities declined precipitously, they leveled out, and then they went, and they've been going up for the last two or three years. So what's going on with that? What caused them to fall and what's causing them to rise? Well, research we conducted at the Texas A&M Transportation Institute in conjunction with our colleagues at the University of Michigan gives some insight into what's going on. First, we need to understand that the key components of fatality are exposure and risk. Exposure is how much we travel. And risk is the likelihood that there's a fatality for any one given unit of that travel. Just like getting the flu is a, fa is a function of how many people you're exposed to that already have the flu, and how susceptible you are as an individual for getting the flu. And it varies from person to person. And it, just like our risk does, vary from person to person in traffic crashes. And one thing's for sure. One of those two things, exposure or risk, has to go down in order for fatalities to go down, one or both. And what we find is if we look at what happened to exposure and risk over a, some, what else happened in that period from 2005 to 2011? You may recall something called the Great Recession. It wasn't good. The economy tanked. People lost their jobs. They lost their homes. We didn't buy as much. We didn't make as much. We didn't deliver as much. So that all affects travel. So will that explain it? Did exposure go down enough just because we didn't travel as much? Well, this graph gives us some insight to that. At the bottom, you can see the fatalities as they occurred over that period of time. And the top line in orange is if we assume that travel, that risk was the same and only travel varied according to the way that it was reported and measured, how many fatalities would have occurred? And you can see that the decline in travel does not explain all of the reduction in fatalities. But if you assume that volume was the same, that we traveled the same amount, and risk varied as we measured it during that period, that's the line in turquoise. So it was risk, more than travel, that went down. So what might explain that? Well, as researchers, we look at variation and look to see what we might associate it with. And we looked at factors in four different categories. We looked at safety regulations, the change in laws over that period regarding drunk driving, helmet use, and seat belts. We looked at roadway and safety spending in each of the states, whether they were on building new roadways or safety programs and projects. Vehicle safety, we looked at how new the fleet is. We looked at the percentage of cars built after 1991 that are in the fleet. Because since that time, there have been continual improvements in the crashworthiness, the structure of the car, airbags, electronic stability control. And finally, we looked at a whole host of economic factors. The amount of economic activity per capita in each state, the median income, how much alcohol was consumed, the unemployment rate, and gas prices. And what did we find? Well, we found that changes in safety regulations accounted for 2 to 3 percent. It's not that laws don't work. They do change behavior. It's just that most states have pretty good laws, and they didn't change much over this time. Roadway and safety spending, we know how to build safer roads, and we do. And we know how to build projects that improve safety at intersections and along the roadway. And we know how to spend money on programs that help. But we just didn't change much of the money over that time. It was about constant. And in terms of vehicle safety, we get an improvement. And in fact, since the 1960s, research has indicated that this 10 to 12 percent decline in fatalities has been a result of better and safer cars. And in terms of economic factors, it's 85 percent. 
and one single factor accounts for half, over half, 60% of the decline in fatalities. And what is that? The unemployment of 18 to 24 year olds. Now from the looks of this audience, we have a number of people in the demographic here. And you probably know someone else, not yourself, that's a risky driver. Someone that's uh, aggressive, particularly if they're a young man. And it's not all your fault. You don't have a lot of experience. You may think you have a lot of experience, but you don't have a lot of experience. And there's a thing up here called the prefrontal cortex, and it doesn't fully develop until you're 25. <laughs> and that's what uh, governs judgment. And judgment's a pretty important thing to have while you're driving, or walking, or biking, or riding a motorcycle. But what would happen? Well, it turns out that the economic downturn, the Great Recession, really affected 18 to 24 year olds more than anybody else. You didn't have a job. And when you don't have a job, you don't have a reason to travel to work in the morning and come back at home at night. And you don't have any money to spend on much of anything, so there's not really much reason to travel, and you wouldn't have enough money to get a car and, and uh, drive anyway and buy gas. So it turns out that this has a really big effect. So what does all this mean for us? Well, we know that if the economy tanks and we take risky uh, drivers like that guy at the top out and we don't drink as much, because that happened during that time, beer sales went down, we don't die in drunk crashes as much, and if general economic activity, particularly rural travel, went down during this time, and it's more risky than urban travel. Laws aren't gonna save us because there's really not that many laws to put in effect anymore. And roadway projects, well, they do some good, but are we going to double the amount of spending on it? Are we going to spend a whole lot more than we are right now? And vehicles, they have had that steady decline. But the problem is, is that there's evidence that that benefit has run its course. We all drive pretty modern cars that have good structural components and airbags and electronic stability control. Now there's a lot of promising technology like automatic braking that has great promise. 2% of the fleet has that right now. And those changes are very evolutionary. You have to buy a new car that has that safety feature and take advantage of it in order for it to lower your risk. And those automatic cars that everybody's going to drive according to some in the next five years, I don't think they're not ready for prime time. You've seen what's happened here lately in the news. We'll be lucky if our, your children are driving those cars to any great extent. And again, it'll be evolutionary. So that's pretty discouraging, Robert. Well, we don't want the economy to tank. We'd like for you folks to have jobs. And I know your parents would like for you to have jobs when you get out of Texas A&M. And we certainly aren't going to pass a whole lot more rules and laws and the, and the Roadway projects aren't going to save us. Who can save us? Who can lower risk? Well, you can, and I can, and the person sitting next to you on either side can, if we will. And how might we do this? Well, we can act as individuals, we can act as parents, and we can act as members of society. So what's the most important thing? Well, buckle up. It's every person, it's every position in the car, it's every day, it's every trip. Over half of the people that die in Texas in cr traffic crashes are unbuckled. Yet, our daytime rate is about 90%. And by clicking that belt in, you reduce your risk by 50%. Now, how many of you are fans of classic rock and roll? Okay, there's three or four. Well. We have failed as a generation to pass on uh, important things. And well, how many of you know who the doors are? Not where, yeah, I know you're looking for the door right now, but okay, the door, okay, some. So the doors were a classic rock band in the late 60s. And it turns out they had pretty good advice about driving. They have a song called Roadhouse Blues. And in that song, they admonished the listener to keep your eyes on the road, your hands upon the wheel. And in research we conducted at the Texas A&M Transportation Institute, we found that's true. We took a bunch of drivers, young, old, male, female, and we put them in the driving test. We did a simulator, and then we took them out to the Rallis campus and had them driving real cars. 
And while they were doing that, we annoyed them. We distracted them. We distracted them by asking them math questions and history questions while they're driving. That's pretty annoying, right? And then we asked them, we ratcheted it up, and we said, hey, you know, how do you get along with your mom? And uh, what do you think about your ex-boyfriend or girlfriend? So we kind of got them a little emotional. And then finally, we had them do something that everybody seems to love to do. What did they do? They got out that old cell phone, and we asked them to text. So while they were texting, they were still having to drive. And guess how they did? Not well. It turns out that there's a function in our brain that as long as we have our hands on the wheel and our eyes on the road, we have an automatic mechanism, even though we're not thinking about it, that makes automatic corrections in our steering. And they're symmetrical corrections. You tend to do pretty good as long as you got. But what happens when you take your eyes off and put it on that cell phone to do that very essential message to that very essential person that can't wait? Well, it turns out you break that loop. That loop's not working any longer and you start to make erratic corrections in your steering, which means you're wandering over the, all over the road. And what happens to your risk when you wander all over the road? It goes up. We can drive safer cars. They're not all built the same. You can look at the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration's website or the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety and get ratings on new cars. And whatever car we drive, whether it's old or new, we can maintain it so it doesn't break down on the side of the road. And if it does break down on the side of the road, stay in it. The car is actually designed to take an impact from another vehicle. You and I are not. And we lose a real alarming number of people that are accidental pedestrians. And if you get stuck, then use this thing and call your roadside assistance. Oh, wait, you don't have roadside assistance? Take a look at your driver's license after the session. That number, 1-800-525-5555, is on there. Now, it's in microprint, but since you're young people, you can, look, you can see it a lot better than I can. And you got plenty of time because you're broke down. If you're going to be a pedestrian or a bicyclist, how about being visibly smart? Now, what does that mean? Well, number one, if you think just because that, you can see that vehicle with those headlights and those headlights are touching you, that that driver can see you, you're wrong. We need to be having bright, reflective clothing or carrying lights. Orange is the new black. And we need to be where we are expected. So that's being the smart part. Because the more, the, if we're where we're expected, then the driver's more likely to see us. And that means crossing at the corner, or within the crosswalk, or being in the bicycle lane, not going the wrong way, or crossing mid-block, or doing those things. Because we can't expect the motorists to expect things they don't expect. And if you're going to bike and walk and ride, there are a number of online resources like Wike, B Walk, Bike Safe, or Share the Road, or Look, Learn, Live, that tell you how things that you can do to reduce your risk as a bicyclist, as a pedestrian, as a motorcyclist. And it also has tips about how we as drivers can drive around those people more safely. Gear up. If you're on two wheels, you need to have a helmet on. But on a motorcycle, it's more than that. It's a jacket, it's boots, it's gloves, it's riding pants. And that may look like fun down there, but that's, those people are increasing the chance of losing skin when they hit that slick spot by 93%. And their risk of injury or fatality goes up by 30 or 40%. Now you may think that the proper attire for riding a scooter is flip-flops, shorts, a t-shirt, and a ball cap. Let's change that at Texas A&M and start riding a little bit more safely. Now, you may see, have seen this sign there at the entrance to Texas. It says, welcome to Texas. Drive friendly the Texas way. I think we might afford a few more and put them around the rest of the state and remind ourselves, particularly College Station, maybe. So what does drive friendly mean? Well, maybe we should leave a little bit earlier and not speed quite as much. Speeding is represented in about 23% of fatalities. And for every 10% increase in speed, you get a 45% increase in the likelihood of death. And it's particularly devastating to our bicyclists and pedestrians. They're not designed for a collision with a motor vehicle. 
and the speeds above 30, 35 miles an hour is particularly bad. Now, how many of you are parents? Okay, how many of you know parents? How many of you have parents? How many of you want to be parents someday? Okay, everybody, very good. So as a parent, what can we do? Well, number one, we should model good behavior. We can buckle up. We can keep our eyes on the road and our hands on the wheel, and we can remember what we learned in kindergarten about sharing. Sharing the road, sharing the road with other people in cars and bikes and motorcycles and walking. We can buy a car seat, buy a good car seat. There are online resources from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration that tell you how to rank those and put them in right and use them right. And you say, hey, look, there's an instruction manual. I got this. Well, observational studies indicate about half of them are put in wrong when you just look inside the car. When you do a really complete examination, up to 93% are installed and used incorrectly. Yet there are 1,600 trained child passenger safety technicians in the state of Texas that are standing by ready to help you put it in correctly. They're on the internet. We can buy a safer car for our team. Now what's the car that the team, the first, the initial team driver gets? The oldest one in the family, right? Who's the riskiest group? The young driver. What's the, young, the least safe car? The old one. Maybe we ought to buy, give them the new one. Now, the parents, you might want to take a ball-peen hammer to it before you give it to them, because that way you won't be so upset the first scratch they get. But there is resources to buy used cars, and the, and the Insurance Institute has those. And the one thing that we can do that's better than almost anything else is seat time with a, supervised, with a supervisor. Now, it doesn't have to be a professional. It can be you, or it can be your friend if you don't want to go through that stress. But the more time that teens and novice drivers spend with supervision, the less risk they have going forward. Australian research tells us that. You can have them join a teen driving safety group. The family's acting for community traffic safety, or teens in the driver's seat, National Organization for Youth Safety, and Students Against Destructive Decisions. They're all working to help kids learn how to make better decisions behind the wheel and in life. So what can we do as members of society? Well, maybe the first thing we need to say is enough is enough. We don't have to die this way. Our friends don't have to die this way. A hundred people don't have to die this way every day. And what should we do about it? Well, maybe we should advocate in our communities, in our state, for more safety improvements. Let's increase the spending on new roads and safety projects. And let's advocate for more enforcement. I know that's pretty kind of scary, but listen, if you're doing all those things that we talked about, you don't have to worry about this guy in the sunglasses, do you? And don't we want everybody else to kind of lower our risk too? That's the kind of guys that do that. Get active, join a coalition here in the Brazos Valley, the Injury Prevention Coalition in Houston, Safe Kids, or the Injury Prevention Center of Greater, Greater Dallas. Because in the end, we're not gonna wait for somebody else to save us. Our future is in our hands. Thank you. <laughs>